climbing mountains would have been considered an act of lunacy. Mountains were the places of parents, not beauty. They were either very hostile or very holy, nothing in between. People would, if necessary, people would go around the mountains, but not to the top. As there were already enough risk and danger in the daily life, there was no need to go to the mountains. But gradually over the years, people started to <coughs> go to the mountains. As the people were moving in the cities, as the cities were grew big, people were moving away from the nature. And mountains were falling them again. Adventure replaced reverence, fascination replaced fear. Greatest peaks of the world were calling humans. And of this, of these greatest peaks, the greatest one, Mount Everest. In 1924, before 1924, like more than 100 years before, the history of uh, uh, mountaineering on Everest started. There were 10th and 15, 15 to 20 expeditions. And in 1924, George Mallory and Irvine, their team members saw them going towards the summit, but they were never returned back. It's still a mystery whether they were to the top or they died while going up or while coming back. After 1924, there were another 10 to 15 expeditions, but the landmark expeditions came in year 1953, when Tanjing Norgad and Pindilari climbed the highest peak of the world. And that expedition opens the imagination of the people to pursue mountaineering as an adventure. Mountains made of rock and ice are also made of dreams and desires. For every one of you, mountains offers a different imagination. Some of you would like to capture them and draw the beautiful landscapes in the canvas. Some of you would like to write a poetry in front of them. Some of you would like to dance and sing in front of them. For my mentor, Ms. Bachindri Pal, the first Indian woman to climb Mount Everest, mountaineering is a tool for the leadership development and help people realize their dreams. And also the tool for the women empowerment. One of my friends is working in the mountains for the people of the mountains and providing solar energy in the remote areas of the country. And for me also, mountains were a way to challenge myself, to test my own capabilities and push my limits. In 2015, after, after getting inspiration by, by reading about all the mountain, all the historic mountain heroes and taking inspiration from my mentor, I decided to take a, take a leap of faith and chose mountaineering as a career and leaving my conventional corporate job. In 2015, I got the opportunity to climb the highest peak of the world. Everest was not an overnight thinking that in the night I thought tomorrow I will go to the Everest. I did a lot of training before it, a lot of training for it, a lot of preparation for it. And in 2015, I got the uh, opportunity to climb. So to climb the Everest on any other 8,000 meter peak, roughly it takes two months time, just the expedition. And why it takes so much of time, just to imagine, if I take all of you guys in a flight and put you on the top of the Everest, we all will die in a minute. Why? Because the oxygen at that level is one third of the sea level. What, what is the oxygen we have right here? So our bodies have to be acclimatized and that's how people climb. And what's the process of acclimatization? Acclimatization means you are making yourself adapt to the low oxygen. You are going up, so what you do? You go up <coughs> high on the mountain, you go to the higher camps and you come back again. And that's how the RPCs in your body are developing to carry low amount of oxygen. So just to show you the route of the Everest, so base camp is at 70,500 feet and the summit 29,035 feet. So between base camp and summit there are four different camps. So in the acclimatization process for the one month you go up to the camp one, come back again, do the camp, go to camp to come back again. And that's how the process continues. And once you are finally ready for the summit push, you start from the base camp, go to camp 2, 3, 4 and above camp 4 is also called the soul where oxygen is so low that your cells of the body are deteriorating every time. So, as the uh, as I was in 2015 and uh, uh, I was on my acclimatization rotation and I will show you one small video for you. So, there is one small video, so it was on 25th of April 2015, if you remember there was a big earthquake in Nepal. So, this is the video of the base camp where base camp is like our home for one month.
Mumbai show called 25th of April. So at that time, I was in Camp 2. So Camp 2 is uh, Camp 2 is uh, surrounded by the. So this is like Camp 2. It's surrounded by the three 8,000 like two 8,000 meter peak. Uh, low side and Everest on two sides and one loop side on the other side. So uh, I just, as per part of my presentation, I just reached camp two and I, I was sipping tea, in, that, uh, sipping tea in, our, in my tent with the fellow climber and I suddenly we felt that ground was shaking. And being camp two on the glacier, we felt like ground will open up and we will all will go inside. And the weather was very bad. Right now weather looks very good, but at that time weather was very bad and we can't see in front of us. But there was an avalanche in the face in front of us. So it was little away from us, so we were safe. Then we, when we came out of our tent, uh, one of the fellow climber told me that if there is an avalanche on the face left side of us, we could be in danger. And then I see up, and then the huge sea of rocket ice was coming towards us. And for the moment, my heart, my heart beat stopped. You can't run an avalanche. And it all happened in seconds. We were lucky enough that we were not in a direct fall zone, and uh, we, we got safe. So after that we came inside our tents, we were holding to the poles because when the avalanche happens, the debris, like rocks and ice, they also scattered <laughs> around the place. So by, at that time I thought it's something localized what's happening. But by the evening we realized that uh, we got the information that more than 10,000 people have died in Nepal and more than 15 people have died in the base camp. So after that there was no point of climbing. We got rescued from the helicopter from camp 1. So I, at that time I was disappointed, but at the same time I felt I am very fortunate that I am, I am alive. We can always go back to the mountains, mountains will always be there. And in the mountaineering we say it's optional to go up, but necessary to come down. So after that we came back. <laughs> so after that, uh, when I, so uh, like uh, for the next two years there was always a, always a dream to climb the highest peak of the world. And uh, there, was, there were also the moments of self-doubt, whether I'm on the right track. There were the people who were, there were my friends and colleagues who were climbing the corporate ladder, and I'm still thinking about how to climb the ladder. But in 2017, I got the opportunity once again, and to climb the highest peak of the world. And just to take you fast forward, I'm taking you to the final summit day. On 26th of May, 2017, at 8.30 in the evening, we started from the camp 4 at 26,400 feet. And before that, I was not able able to sleep for three four nights because of very that because when you are inside the tent, you feel like you are suffocating inside the tent because oxygen is so low. And uh, I was not able to sleep. I was meant, I was tired. But you are so close to the summit, you can't give up. So we started from the camp for at eight thirty in the evening, and we start in the night because we want to reach the summit as early as possible in the morning because normally weather turns bad in the afternoon time. So we were coming from the uh, so we were on the way to the summit. So around 1 1 a.m. in the morning, like 1 a.m. 1:30 a.m., uh, I saw two of the three climbers who were who were going ahead of me. They were looking like a 20 30 feet giants. And then I looked them again, and they were looking the same. And then I blinked my eyes twice or thrice, and then it felt normal. After a certain time, I I imagine there is one person sitting on the ledge of the mountain. And then the my, my logical mind mind says, no one can sit at that at, at, at that altitude. And then I blinked my eyes again and everything was quite normal. So basically I was hallucinating. Because of extreme exhaustion, extreme tiredness, my mind was hallucinating. In terms of safety, I was doing all right. So at that time my body was on, all, all, like, already on the verge of giving up. And then I remembered the lines from my mentor. When you are extremely tired, extremely fatigued, you just focus on your next three steps. And when you take then just forget the summit, take next three steps. When you take next three steps, deep take a deep breath and again take next three steps. And slowly and slowly move, you are more close to the summit. Because mountaineering is a sport, it's not like cricket or football, where people are cheering for you, where team members are cheering for you. It's more like a battle within yourself. You have to call your inner reserves, you have to challenge yourself, and you have to encourage yourself. Then only you can move forward. So this way I continued my journey, like I continued my climb and finally on 6.25, 6 10 a.m. on 27th of May, I was on the top of the world, on the highest peak of the world. <laughs> on the summit, everything flashed back in front of my eyes. I thank to the mountain gods, thank to the people in the country, the people who have supported me throughout the journey. And at the same time, you can't relax because you have to come back down again. <laughs> the expedition is not yet over in the time you are not in the base camp. 
and Everest, like summiting mountains, not just the Everest, <coughs> summiting a peak gives you a profound experience. It gives you a feeling that you can't remain on the top all the time. You have to come down again and you have to be prepared for the next journey, which would be more challenging and more difficult. Because when you are in the nature in front of the mountains, you feel how small you are in the scope of the world. And it teaches you humility. The mountains have taught me working in a team, taking decisions, uh, helping each other, trusting each, trust each other, and in that pushing my limits. After that, uh, after Everest, I was, I remember, I was trekking in Himalayas, in Uttarakhand, and I was trekking in the beautiful meadows, and I was coming down the mountain, and from the distance, I noticed a fox. And when I went closer, I saw the fox, he, uh, it was trying to eat a food from the, uh, from the pile of a trash. And, and at the same time, I remember one scene, like five, three years back, I was doing my diploma in outdoor education from National Outdoor Leadership School, and I was uh, sleeping in, inside like such a snow cave. And I woke up in the morning, and uh, when just I was rubbing my eyes, I saw a fox just mm -hmm. the, at the door of the cave. And at that time, I felt like how close I am to the nature. This is the world I, I am craving for. And uh, that fox gave me the moment of lifetime. And when I was in Himalayas, we are give, we as a humans are giving slow death to the these to the fox once again. So two contrasting situations, and that triggered me that we have to do something. So as we said, we should start from our own home. So at TSF we do lot of camps. So in in mountain regions, if you see the about the solid waste, if you see the waste, there are lot of different. Uh, uh, different types of material in the waste, like plastic, then clothes and paper, and even, even the organic waste. So if you segregate waste, then some of the waste can be recycled or can be reused. But in mountains facility, in, in rural areas, there are no such facilities. So you have to find out the best possible solution. So this is a what very small, simple solution what we did. We segregated waste, and if you see the plastic wrappers, they are the most more notorious waste because you can't recycle them again. So you have to we somehow use them. So what we did, we just collected the plastic wrappers. We we what we do, we stuff them in the bottles and then we tie the bottles together. And on the right hand corner, right hand corner, you can see it can be used as a stool. It can be used as a furniture. So just trying to create the value from the waste. And uh, to create a larger impact, we had a we team of 40 people. We did a 1500 kilometers journey from <coughs> Haridwar to Patna. And the uh, 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 Ma'am wanted to do, do this expedition for a long time. And our, uh, we had the two objectives. One was to clean the river, and second was to create the awareness. So we interacted with a lot of kids in the journey. And uh, uh, so, and our main objective was to do, do it in an adventurous way. So we did it by our raft rafting. So this expedition uh, had great learnings to us, to the team, like uh, how the in some of the cities we noticed the landfill, it just close to the river. Like all the waste is going in the river. The fever is waste is going into the river. <coughs> and I was standing on the Malikandika Ghat <coughs> in Banaras. It's the largest tributary ghat in the country, where more than 150 to 200 bodies are burnt every day. And when I was standing over there at 1.30 a.m. in the night, in the, in the early morning, you can say, and I was seeing like bodies were coming, and there was, there was, there was no mission from the people. And death and life, life and death was feeling just a normal thing, like it's part of the life. And when I, I was noticing one of the pandit performing the rites very close, <coughs> closely, so there was a wooden pyre, then they put the body, and he was throwing some, like he was taking out some samagri from the, bag of a plastic and putting on the body. And at the end what he did, he put the plastic on the body itself and burnt the body. And then it came to a strong realization, when the child is born, he, he or she is drinking uh, milk from the plastic bottle and to the end of, end of our lives. How the plastic has been inbuilt in our, in our life cycles. And still we don't know how we can efficiently or wisely use it. And if you see with the so how the way our societies are progressing, the more wealth is coming, our consumption patterns are increasing, and slowly the we are using plastic again and again. And 800 million people are living in India, living in the rural areas. And if you see every now and then, we every 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 month we are creating another man-made mountains. So maybe in the future 
we will have these mountains and I, I have a question for you. Do you have the same feelings what you have for the natural mountain? Do you still want to paint them? Do you still want to climb on them? Or do you still want to sing and dance in them? If no, this is what we are giving to our next generation. Thank you.